talk to you guys a little bit about bighorn restoration in the state of Oregon. Um, kind of show you the path that has gone through from an agency and a, and a partner support standpoint of, of getting these sheep available so that you could get this tag this year. Uh, John is our district biologist down out of Lake County. So South Central, any of those hunts down in around Lake County, he'll be the man you want to talk to later today. So with that, John. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for coming. Um, I know for a lot of you, it's a big travel. It's a weekend that, that you probably were thinking about maybe scouting for your hunt. Uh, and so I, you know, there's a lot of reasons that, uh, that I certainly appreciate you all coming. Uh, so thanks. And, and thanks to Oregon for Nas too. Well, about a lot of what I'm about to talk about, uh, it lands directly on their shoulders. That Foundation for North American Wild Sheep and the Oregon chapter has been a phenomenal supporter of, of sheep restoration in this state. And so not only are you incredibly lucky, obviously, as you all know, to have drawn a tag, but the fact that we can hunt sheep in this state at all is, is really the result of a tremendous amount of effort. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, thank you, give you just kind of the short and sweet version of, of that history. Um, is there a clicker button somewhere I should be using? Here, let's try that. Yeah. So California sheep or California bighorn sheep were extirpated in the state by 1915. Uh, prior to that, if you can believe this, California bighorn sheep were the most common big game animal in the state of Oregon. There were more sheep in this state than there were mule deer uh, prior to extirpation. Um, the, the Rocky Mountain bighorns that were more up in Northeast Oregon, those were, those were gone, eliminated from the landscape by 1945, so quite some time ago. And if you think back to what you might know about the history of the state prior to those dates, um, the, the reasons for that loss of bighorn sheep are really boiled down to two things, unregulated and uncontrolled harvest and over harvest of sheep and livestock diseases. And of course, at that time, we really didn't fully understand or understand at all the link between domestic sheep and domestic sheep diseases and wild sheep. And our lack of understanding of that cost, uh, cost the state its sheep herds. We, uh, we were successful in bringing California sheep back into the state in 1954. And that first successful reintroduction was at Hart Mountain in, in Lake County. Uh, that, that started with, I, I believe the number was 38 sheep that were brought in at that time. And that started everything back up after extirpation. It wasn't until 1971 that we got Rocky Mountain sheep reintroduced and, and going again. Um, so it took them a little bit longer and took some more effort with, with domestic uh, outfits in that Snake River country to, to be able to try again. Uh, that first rocky reintroduction was actually in the Wallowa Mountains, not in, in Hell's Canyon there. Uh, and so that's led since then, since that successful reintroduction at Hart Mountain and again in, in 1954 and the successful reintroduction in 1971 in the Wallowas, we've been capturing and moving sheep. Uh, and there's several reasons why we do that. Uh, the primary one from the beginning has been to establish viable herds in, in available and suitable habitats. And in those days, in, you know, in the early 60s and, and late 60s, we still didn't really understand the link between domestic sheep and, and wild sheep diseases. But we knew we had what we thought was bighorn sheep habitat that didn't have any sheep in it. And so we started catching sheep out of a, out of, uh, a growing population at heart and moving them around. We also understood and, and have come to understand much, much better since that genetic diversity in these herds was important. Um, throughout the history of, of transplanting in this state, we've started many of the herds that you guys are hunting with, with really small releases, sometimes as few as 10 sheep into a new area. And so that's been the source herd for, for what's there now. And we've, we've, through time, come to understand that there's some consequences to lack of genetic diversity that we try and address through transplantation. transplantation. Um, we do now have, because of the success that we've had, we do now have some herds that are exceeding carrying capacity. And there's a couple of consequences from that. The primary one is as, as sheep herds begin to become overpopulated in their range, they, they start dispersing. And, and what happens is they wind up in places where the sheep really don't belong. And often that means encountering domestic sheep, which causes trouble. Uh, and we do a bunch of capture work uh, and we're catching sheep and leaving them right where we caught them sometimes to monitor for disease. And that's all on the heels of, of what we've come to understand about sheep disease pathogens and, and epizootic events. Um, so specifically for California sheep, at this point we're at about 3,700 sheep in 32 herds. That's a pretty rough number. 
and it changes through time. We've lost some herds to disease. We've, some things have changed, but we're, we're getting close to 4,000 sheep in 32 different spots. We've moved 1,344 sheep within the state of Oregon. So um, basically from the beginning, Heart Mountain and then as other herds started to establish, we started pulling from other places. But you can essentially think of it as, uh, you know, those original Heart Mountain sheep have resulted in, in 1,300 plus sheep moved in state. Uh, we've brought, through time, we've brought 90 additional sheep into the state. And we've brought those from, from British Columbia, uh, from Nevada and from Idaho. We try to be pretty thoughtful about bringing sheep in, uh, especially as we, in the early days of, of what we've kind of come to call the great bug hunt. Uh, we spent about 30 years trying to figure out what the bug was that was killing sheep. And so until we knew and without knowing, we've been very careful about bringing sheep in. But we've moved in that same time, we've, we've been the source herd for, for moving 352 sheep out of state to, the, to places including Idaho. We've, we've sent sheep to North Dakota uh, we sent sheep to Nevada, Washington, and Wyoming, all to help with the same things that in those states that we've dealt with here. Um, and since 2015, which was kind of the kind of the culmination of the great bug hunt, about 2015 we came to to know a bug called Mycoplasma ova pneumonia, MOV for short. And since then we've sampled 233 sheep through capture efforts uh, in the state. Okay, so I realize the screen's a little hard to see you guys, but for those of you that have California bighorn sheep tags, this is the kind of country you're looking at, if you can see it on screen there. Yeah, you can't. This is what it's gonna look like uh, <laughs> looking through the smoke right now. Uh, um, well, I guess I'll just describe it for, for any of the that don't know. You tend to be out in more arid places, more rangeland country, more sagebrush and juniper than, than pine trees. And basically, these sheep herds are existing on rims. Uh, there'll be a, a rim rock somewhere, whether it be the side of Steens Mountain, historically, the face of Hart Mountain, uh, Abert Rim, if those names ring any bells. There's just these places in the desert where we've got some escape terrain, some, some rocky cover. And these herds are existing in, in little island pockets in those places. Okay, so. Uh, so that's. That's, if you can see it, you can kind of tell the difference in color. I might even have a magic pointer pen up here somewhere. Uh, yeah, look at that. You can't, you can't quite see it very well, but essentially all these units in here, the whole southeast corner of the state, have sheep in them somewhere. California bighorn sheep. Uh, we've also got California bighorns up in this part of the state here where we are now. That's primarily the Deschutes River and John Day River herds. Um, there's some other smatterings of, of sheep herds in there as well. But that's a pretty big chunk of eastern Oregon, considering that historically sheep range in the state was everything from this line right here that we all know to be the crest of the Cascades east. It was all sheep habitat at one point. We've, we've been fairly successful in bringing sheep back into, into historic habitats. For the Rockies, um, we've got right now almost 700 sheep across 12 different herds of Rocky Mountain Bighorn sheep. Um, we did, the, to back up a little bit, we did try, or the, my, my predecessors tried in 1938, this is 1939, it was actually 1938, we tried to bring in some Rocky Mountain Bighorn sheep to Hart Mountain. At that time, we didn't have a clear understanding of what subspecies of sheep was actually, actually occupying the Southeast Oregon desert country. So we tried with, with Rocky Mountain sheep first, that actually failed. And it wasn't until 1954 that we brought in some California sheep out of, out of British Columbia that succeeded. Uh, the, the Rocky release, the Rocky Mountain release that worked was 40 sheep brought in from Alberta into the Lalauas in 1971, like I mentioned. Um, since then, we've moved 122 of those Rockies within Oregon either to establish new herds or to, to genetically supplement existing herds. Um, we've brought 328 Rocky Mountain sheep into Oregon. Um, and those have come from places as far and wide as Alberta and British Columbia, Colorado, and as close as Idaho, Montana, and Washington. We've given 73 sheep to, to Idaho and Washington at this point. So we've had through time 
opportunities with certain herds if they've succeeded and start to reach a, a density where we're concerned about disease events or we're, we're concerned about dispersal we've been able to supply some sheep to other states and so this is for those of you with Rocky Mountain tags this is the kind of country you're looking at um, a little different than than most of our desert stuff um, surprisingly most of Oregon's Rocky Mountain habitat is is substantially lower elevation than the than the California sheep populations so you're not really dealing with you know 11 12,000 foot mountains but given the way they sit on the landscape this is the kind of stuff you're, you're looking at uh, pretty big mountains lots of country for them to be in so here again uh, as it stands uh, historic Rocky Mountain sheep habitat would have been a little bit broader but we've got them we've got them going essentially in, in most of what existed for historic Rocky habitat that's a pretty good picture there of, of, of the historic range. Like I mentioned, historically, the crest of the Cascades was kind of the break. You could find sheep across any of this country before 1915. Uh, as it stands, we've, we've got them reintroduced and doing basically fairly well in all these dark spots. And like, like I said, you can see in there essentially where the rocky rims are. That's, that's basically a picture of that. What's facilitated that is a change, well, largely what's facilitated that is a change in domestic livestock use. There's a long history in Oregon of domestic sheep grazing on these landscapes that, tr that transition through time based on market pressures to cattle. And so without the influence of domestic sheep in those landscapes, these, these rim rocks have become open again to wild sheep. Uh, in terms of how we do this stuff, uh, when we're catching sheep, we're, we're mostly either trapping them in, in uh, established kind of bait set traps or we'll use a drive net, which is a net that we put up on light poles and then the kind of on the back side of a ridge. We usually use a helicopter as they come over the ridge, they run into that net. Or most often the tool, kind of the tool du jour is, is helicopter net gunning. And so what we're doing there is using a helicopter to put, it, put a capture crew in the sheep rocks and use a kind of a specialized, uh, specialized weapon basically to shoot a net with weights on it over the top of an individual sheep. There's a lot of advantage to that. There's a lot of ability to be selective in what we're doing. We can pick the spots and make sure that the sheep are in a spot where we can catch them without, without hurting them. There's, there's quite a bit of advantage to that technique. Um, if you can see it there, this is a picture of, of uh, oh, I would guess this was maybe taken in the mid 70s to early 80s, something like that. Um, this is a picture through a drive net of sheep coming into the, coming into the pinch point. Um, and so uh, I realize it's a little hard to see, but uh, you can obviously see the net. These sheep are running in. What you probably can't see is there's a wing and net over here. So they're actually in a V of, of net that they're going to run into. We don't do much of that anymore, although at, at times, especially on Heart Mountain, that was a really effective tool. And this is a picture here of, of more of a trap. And so we'll, um, they, we'll get them coming to a bait and then set a trap over it such that they kind of trip the line as they come in. We still use that, uh, especially on the Lostine herd in, the, in some of the Rocky Mountain areas. And this is a picture of a, of a pass bio, I believe, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's Parent Baker, uh, flying with Gary Brennan, the pilot, in a, in a helicopter called a Hughes 500D. It's kind of, a, kind of a, the, the, the ship that, that we like to use, or that the capture guys like to use. Um, and so you can kind of tell, Parent's not a real big guy, but if you can't tell, he's filling every bit of that back door. It's not a big space. Um, and I realize you can't see it super well, but that right there and that right there, are there's, there's two more below it. Those are barrels, four barrels with weights in them, and a net bag in the middle that shoots out over the top of a sheep. Again, another picture there of that, of that same capture aircraft. Um, typically what we're doing is, uh, or what capture crews are doing, you'll have a, a gunner in the back seat behind the pilot and you'll have either one or maybe two muggers in the, in the helicopter and so the net gunner fires the net down over the sheep and then the, the, the pilot will circle in and drop off a mugger to work that sheep up. Uh, There's another pretty picture there of that helicopter taking off that you can't see super well. Um, and ultimately this is the result. We end up with with sheep on the mountain. I, I realize it's hard to see, but uh, there's a red ear tag right there on that sheep. It's, it's a sheep we know. And so it's been a, a very successful program. It really truly is one of the, one of the greater conservation success stories in the state. 
Um, often in the media, we hear about things like bald eagles, which were another success story where those were, uh, were, in, were threatened at some point and they've come back. We hear lots about those kind of stories. It's often kind of a misunderstood how much of a conservation success story bighorn sheep really are, especially in a state like Oregon. Uh, another picture here of a bunch of rams um, kind of shows you what, if nothing else, this picture will give you a little bit of an idea of, of what sheep do when they get spooked. They tend to they tend to wad up in a ball, and so they, you know they do it under us in a helicopter, and they'll do it with with other things that they're responding to as predators around too. They kind of they kind of ball up, which can make shooting a little tough. Um, these sheep here are running up the hill. The point of this picture was to show off a collar right there that, that we use to, to track movements and to track survival and mortality. Um, and that's the view from the gunner's chair. Um, again, hard to see you guys, but a uh, couple of barrels there, a net bag in the middle, and a very large ram right there. Okay, so when we do get them, uh, typically in a net gun, what we're doing, we when we put the mugger down, we're getting them blindfolded, hobbled, get them calmed down, get them out of the net. We're always taking blood, we're always taking fecal samples, uh, we're measuring several other things, and generally we're putting a collar on them. And these days, and for the last a bunch of years, those collars are, are almost always GPS collars. And so um, we're actually able to use the satellite infrastructure around the planet to, to record locations anywhere from you know, on the really fancy stuff, we can get a location on them every 20 minutes. Usually we wouldn't ever want to do that with sheep. Gen usually we're getting two locations a day, um, which is pretty powerful data when you get to the other end of that. And you've got several years worth of multiple individuals in a herd range showing you how they use that mountain, where they're using those resources, and what's important to them, what isn't. Uh, this here is a, a slightly different helicopter, but a similar operation. If we're, if we're going to transplant them, if we're not going to just release them on site, what we're doing is keeping them blindfolded, keeping them hobbled, keeping them calm as cool as we can. We put them in a, in a bag and then hook a short line onto it and we'll actually hook that line to the belly of the helicopter and transport them on a line back to a base of operations where we can, we can work them up and get them in a trailer if we're going to move them. That's what this is here. That's a, a picture of the helicopter bringing in a string of, of three sheep uh, to a base camp. Well, we'll work them up. We'll get the best disease samples that we can possibly get, which include a, a they, we, we got a great big long Q-tip that we stick down into their mouth without touching anything else and touch this particular spot in the back of their throat that gives us a better, better way to test for MOV in particular than we can get otherwise. So we're able to do some things in base camp that we can't do on the side of a mountain. Um, just another picture there, the same, same thing going on. So those, those ships, those helicopters bring them in, set them down real nice and gentle. We'll go out and, and pick them up, put them on a stretcher and, and bring them to the table. Uh, that's, that's an image there of us working them up. Um, usually everybody's, it seems like a lot of people around that animal, everybody's being real quiet. She's blindfolded, she can't tell what's going on. She's obviously very nervous, very excited, but we're doing everything we can to keep her cool. We've got water on site. We've got IV fluids if we need them. Uh, we do our best to take care of them. Um, that's a picture of, of getting a collar on that ewe. And you can see there, she's, she's blindfolded up. If you can tell, I don't know if you can see it, this, this little white line that you can't tell what it is, that's an oxygen tube. We're, we're feeding her oxygen as we go, trying to keep her calm and healthy as best we can. Um, and we draw quite a bit of blood. We use that blood for a variety of things. We're able to break that up into different, in smaller vials separate serum from red blood cells and do quite a bit of, of looking at disease history on an individual and testing for active diseases. That's that big long q-tip I was talking about. Um, great picture I know. Uh, right there. That's going, we've got a jaw spreader, opens their mouth, that thing goes back into the back of their throat and touches a spot to give us a really good idea of, of MOV presence. Um, and in this case, we're going to let these sheep go. This was a capture that we did on Heart Mountain in 2019, I think it was. So in this case, we wanted all the samples we could get. We had concerns about that population, significant decline, and we wanted collars on everything we could get, and we wanted those back on the mountain. So we're going to take her off into the sagebrush away from the crew and, and let her go, and away they run. Um, otherwise, we're putting them in a box 
Um, this is essentially a, a kind of a kind of a fancy stock trailer that goes in the back of a pickup is all it really is. And we've used these sheep boxes to transport sheep all over the state. All the history that I that I talked about was primarily done in these boxes. And that's what they look like in the box. If anybody wasn't has hasn't been up close and personal with a U in their face, that's what it looks like. We get to where we're going often. You know what I like about this picture that you can't really see is the volume of mud on the side of these trucks. Often we're we're taking these sheep into places, getting them as close as we can to their existing habitat. The risk, if you don't get them close, is that they come out of the box wild and go the wrong way. And so we're we're usually taking. Uh, you're getting as far as we can as close as we can to the sheep habitat and the hope is that someday you end up with something like this um, we don't necessarily want every sheep on the mountain to have jewelry on it but considering the history considering the work that we've put in that Oregon Finaz has put in to see a ram of that size uh, with a ewe and know that they're doing well they're making babies that's that's kind of what it's all about and hopefully you guys get to take uh, advantage of it too. And so the, you're kind of the recipients and the benefactors of a whole bunch of people's hard work. And it's, it really is a kind of a small miracle that, that you guys are all here with tags in your pocket today. So when you see these guys with the, with the patches on their shirt that say Oregon Finaz, thank them. They worked hard to put you guys here. And thank you all. Uh, Craig Foster ran our sheep program for the state of Oregon for a lot of years. He's now on the uh, the, or the Oregon Finaz board. And he's going to talk to you a little bit about, you know, kind of some do's and don'ts for hunting sheep country. Use the buttons or you can use that. It still says Walt from 22 yeah. years ago. So okay, so, so Walt Van Dyke put this uh, program together uh, a number of years ago. He was one of our sheep bios. All right, hang on. You guys got to wait for me to be technically wiped out. Okay. He was one of our sheep bios for about 30 years. And I got 25 years in as a sheep bio uh, before I retired. And for those 25 years, I talked to hunters just like you. And most of what's in this presentation is what we learned from sheep hunters. You know, I've never had a sheep tag. I've been on four different hunts with friends that did draw sheep tags. But the experience that we're going to give you here is from you guys. Okay, so, so get ready for the bios in this room when you're done with your hunt to pick your brain a little bit about what you're seeing, um, how it worked out for you, and stuff like that. So... <clears throat> Okay. You can't you can't see the pictures, and I'm just going to fly through them. You can see some of the the slides here, but what we want to go through today is just some general big horn horn behavior and the pieces of your hunt that I need you to focus on. Okay. General big born behavior. Obviously, everybody in the room knows, and it's been said several times, these guys are in rough country. The rams are generally in more gentle country um, than the ewes and lambs, okay? If you're a mother trying to protect your baby, you're gonna get in some tough stuff. <clears throat> the rams are about the laziest thing on the mountain you're gonna run into, okay? Um, and the rams are generally not what the ewes and lambs. And when I say that, I want you to think about it from this. If you're seeing a lot of ewes and lambs when you're scouting or when you're hunting, you are in the wrong spot. I don't need you to go five miles away, but I need you to get away from that ewe lamb group. Uh, might be a quarter of a mile, depending on your habitat. You might be able to not even move with your spotting scope, but, but the rams, especially for Oregon seasons that are not during the rut, that leaves out, you know, John Day River and, and the later river hunts. But for the rest of you, you're not hunting in the rut, look away from those ewe lamb groups. Get away from the ewes and lambs and go out from there because the boys don't play with the girls until November. All right? So... The pictures you can't see here is rough country and, 
and Marcus will have this if you want to see some sheep pictures. This is the Owyhee. Okay, so I don't know what they do after dark, but when the sun comes up, they're up feeding. In general, they're going to go to bed somewhere around 9.30, okay? 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock, if it's real hot, they're going to go to bed maybe at 8 o'clock, okay? They're going to get up in the middle of the day once and stretch, walk around, take a leak, lay back down, all right? That becomes really important for you guys because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen here. You're going to be up on the ridge a mile away and you're going to spot a little group of rams. And there, before you can get there, they're going to bed. And they're going to lay there all day. Somewhere, depending on the temperature, somewhere between 3.30 in the afternoon and say 6, they're going to get up and they're going to wander off and feed. But you've got, from the time you spotted them, until 3.30 in the afternoon, to not get to those sheep, but pick a spot that you can shoot from. All right? Pick a spot you can shoot from. So I'm sitting on the ridge. I got my super double-double loophole spotting scope up there. And I see this group of rams. And there's a shooter in the group. And I put them to bed. There's five rams in the group. OK? It's 10 o'clock in the morning. And off we go. We're going to pick the spot. If I can get to that pile of rocks over there, I'll be 100 yards above them, 150 yards above them. OK? And then lay there. Do not try and shoot these guys in their bed. One, because there's all these big guts in the way. A ram's belly, I, I swear to God, it covers the heart when they're laying down. And so you're going to make a bunch of mountain salad if you don't have the exact shot, okay? The other problem is that noon thing. At noon, or thereabouts, they're gonna get up and wander around and lay back down. So I had a hunter one year, came all the way out from Colorado, non-resident hunter. The big ram was on the left. And he worked his way into his shot. The ram was laying there on the left. He couldn't quite see all of his horns. But he shot the ram on the left. It scored 110. It was a year and a half old. Okay, so let him stand up. Make it sure that it's the ram you wanted to shoot. Okay, because when they get up, they don't, unless you scare them, if you slide in there quiet and get set up, they're going to get up. This is 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We're heading out to feed. They're going to get up. They're going to stretch. They're going to walk around. They're going to take a leak. They're going to walk around a little more, and then they're going to start feeding up the hill. It's not a fast process. All right, you've got lots of time. Relax. Make sure that you're shooting, one, the ram you want on your wall, and two, that you can make that good shot. Okay? All right. Kind of went through this before. Um, they don't have any problem rolling rocks. Right, now, one of the ways you find sheep in sheep habitat is with your ears. You'll hear them as they're up feeding and fiddling around. They'll be rolling rocks and it doesn't bother them. But if you roll a rock, they're gonna come find you. They're gonna figure out where you are. They got great eyes, okay? And they can go from being bedded down, laying in the dirt with their horns down, dead to the world asleep, up, jump off a 20-foot cliff, hit the ground running before you can get the safety off. Okay, so when you're sliding in there, don't try and get too close. Get to that spot that you think you can shoot from and then get quiet and then wait, all right, for them to get up. And that other thing, that 9.30 to 3.30 window, that also works the other way. If you've got a ram patterned, okay, and you, so these guys, they're creatures of habit. You can almost set your watch by them. So if you've got a ram that you've been watching and he comes down the ridge and he lays down with his buddies and it's 9.30 in the morning when he goes to bed, let's say, or 8 o'clock in the morning, he's going to do that tomorrow. 
And he's going to do that the next day. And he's going to lay down within five feet of where he laid down the day before until either there's a shift in the weather. So if it's been real hot and dry, and then all of a sudden you get a little rain, that's going to change their pattern. They're going to do something different. They maybe aren't going to scatter the flats and go miles away, but he's not going to lay in this spot. But and then it seems the other thing that I, and, and they never would tell me why, but about every four or five days they start doing something different. Okay, but if you can get him patterned, and let's say you've got a spot, I had some hunters on Poker Gym that were masters at this. They'd figure out the spot the ram laid down, and then before daylight, up the ridge they'd go, and they'd get to a spot they could shoot at that spot, and when the ram came down to go to bed, at 9.30 in the morning, boom, hunt was over. Okay, work started. All right, so you can use that pattern to actually get to a spot that you put a ram to bed yesterday because there's a better than even chance he's coming back there to go to bed today and tomorrow, assuming nobody, you know, boogers him, messes him up and changes his pattern. If you're in the later seasons and it gets cold, they're gonna lay in the sunshine. If you're in the earlier seasons and it's hot, they're gonna find a shady spot, all right? So when you're glassing, you, one, you're looking for anything straight, and the other thing you're looking for, especially in the desert countries, you're looking for anything white or light, okay? The horns, Walt used to say, they, you look for bananas in the top of the sagebrush because they'll be laying there with their head up and you'll just see that that arc of the top of their horn looks like a banana sitting in the sagebrush okay or their rump patch a piece of rump patch while they're laying down white and there's nothing straight out there if you get a straight line that's something that's generally the back of an animal okay so you're we'd all like to say okay i'm just looking for you know 190 rams that's what i'm going to look for uh, uh you're looking for pieces of rams because they're laying down okay this is a bunch of rams in a rock you can't see okay that's another bunch of rams in a rock that you can't see okay so this we i i got ahead of myself the piece of this slide that I need you to, to kind of think about here is that if you have those later seasons, the closer you get to the rut, the less of that lazy pattern that I just described is true. The rams are moving quite a bit more. They're a lot closer to the ewes and lambs. They're testing the ewes for who's coming in early or something like that for estrus cycles. And so, if you have those later hunts, basically anything in October, up maybe into late October, I, all my hunts when I was working, you guys, were in August, so I don't know how late the John Day River hunts went. I didn't pay attention to what Jeremy and Steve had going on. But if you've got those later hunts, get ready for your rams to move a little more. <clears throat> okay, establishing dominance. You can't see this, but this is two Rams button heads. This is the Dodge truck commercial, okay? Um, the, the thing about dominance for you, and you'll have Rams button heads, especially the village idiots, the younger Rams, okay? They'll bump heads and they'll click horns all summer long, all right? The big guys, they might bump heads even during the rut, but generally they can just kind of turn their head to the side and there's that great big horn and they say, yeah, bring it and we'll see who wins and nobody messes with them, okay? But that, if they're bumping heads, it's noisy. If you've ever been out chucker hunting in November and December, you can hear sheep whacking heads from a long ways away. Even me with all this magic stuff in my ears anymore, I can hear rams bumping heads a long ways away. So pay attention to, to what you're hearing, okay? Um, Taylor, the first time sheep hunter talked about the weather, that's real. It can be hotter than a pistol in the afternoon 
and you'll have ice on the dog water in the morning. Okay, so be careful how you dress. You can't pack a lot of weight, you know, because you're up and down the mountains, but make sure you have some good layers. The other thing is that now, anymore, all of us have drawers full of camo. But when Walt built this uh, years ago, nothing white, nothing light. That hat's wrong, this shirt's wrong. Okay, you don't have to be in the latest camo pattern, but you know, greens, grays, tans, darker tans, okay? Don't, don't pack a white handkerchief, nothing white, because they'll be laying on the ridge over there, you haven't even spotted them yet, and you pull out your hanky to, you know, wipe your hands, blow your nose, whatever, and they'll see, they got 10 power eyes, and they'll, they'll see that, so nothing white, ever until you're coming out and then something white to keep somebody else from seeing okay so this slide's about taking have some help all right but there's a downfall with help and over the years i i kind of noticed that the sheep hunter okay brings say you got four or five friends that are going to come with you and they all split up on the mountain and everybody's spotting and everybody's looking around right and they're running you the tag holder ragged hey we got some ram spotted over here okay hey we got a ram spotted over here come over here and look at it and you're back and forth and you're up and down and by the time you get done with your hunt you're exhausted okay so you need to set your help down yeah they get a pack the weight for you, okay? You pack the rifle, you keep the tag, you keep the knives, all that stuff that's in the slide, but don't let them run you ragged, okay? And they will, because they're excited, you're excited, you wanna kill a ram. Here's, so there's a, a, a really, he's a real good sheep guy down in my country, I'm not gonna tell you his name, um, but he told me one time, that the typical sheep hunter, even in good shape, unless you're some, you know, 100 miler runner individual, you've got three and a half days and then the mountain's gonna start beating you. It's gonna start whipping you, all right? So on day one, you're excited. On day two, you're getting a little tired. By day three, you're dragging a little bit. And by day three and a half, you're out. The mountain has now beat you. Oh, by the way, keep in mind that these are 14-day seasons in Brian's country. They're 30-day seasons in our country down south. Okay, take a break. Take a day off. Go fishing, lay in the shade. If you're getting exhausted, rather than shoot a 96-point yearling, yearling ram so you can fill your tag because the mountains beat you, take a day off or two days off. It's a long season, okay? Don't let the mountain whip you. And then the other thing is hunt like a ram. They're the laziest things out there. They're going to bed at 9.30 in the morning, okay? They're not getting up till 3.30 in the afternoon. You need an afternoon nap. Find a chunk of shade and lay there for an hour and a half. If you've got friends, make them scout. I'm I'm ragged out, I'm gonna lay here, okay? I'm gonna lay here for two hours. Okay, hunt like a ram. Be up in the morning, be busy at night, and siesta in the middle of the day. Because you've got three and a half days before the mountain whips you. And then you either, you either take a break or the saddest ones I ever had is the mountain would whip them and they'd go home and they wouldn't come back because they were done. Okay, so don't let the mountain beat you. This, this isn't a race, it's not a competition, it's supposed to be fun, all right? And so go at your pace and take a nap. Okay, this is, have a cougar tag in your pocket. 
So John stood up here and he talked about the disease stuff. All right, we have a significant number of bighorn herds in the state who are suffering from lion depredation. And, and you can help with that because the reality is, is you get lions that are sheep specialists. They learn how to hunt bighorns. And there's a significant amount of research out there that shows that if you can take that lion out of the population from a sport harvest standpoint, you can have years of effect because you've taken the specialist out, all right? Put a cougar tag in your pocket, especially when you're scouting, okay? And if you get the opportunity to use it, please use it because the Heart Mountain situation we're in right now, we've gone from 1954, 22 sheep, 1996, 600 sheep, 2021, 48 sheep. It's lions, it's not disease. Okay, so buy a cougar tag if you don't have one already and please use it. Okay, we've talked about optics, um, and spotting scopes and all that stuff. The important piece of this slide is spend, if, if you're spending more time walking during the day than you are sitting and glassing, you're wrong, okay? When you sit down to glass, grid, detailed gridding. If your eyes start to hurt, I always, the guys, the, mo the most successful sheep hunters for me and the, the few hunts I got to go on, um, if my eyes hurt more at the end of the day than my feet did, I was doing it right. If my eyes were tired, more tired than my feet, I was doing it right, okay? Sit on your butt and use your glass. Okay, this is all the stuff about shade up. Okay, that's rams you can't see, that's rams you can't see. Okay, so we talked about the stock a little bit um, and picking the spot. Okay, that takes some planning approach. If you have help, you don't all go. Somebody sits back. All right, and keeps an eye on those rams just in case they move. Just in case by, there's, there's a good probability from the time you spot your ram until you're in position to shoot will be three to four hours of slipping in to get to the spot. That's real. That's, pro I would bet you right now a six pack of beer of any brand you guys want to choose that half of you are gonna spend three to four hours closing the distance from where you spot to where you shoot, okay? Move slow, be careful about rolling rocks, and don't go to the sheep, go to the spot that you can shoot from, okay? Wind, there's a, a slide up here about wind. The, if you if you're, when you're scouting and when you're hunting during the day, pay attention to what the wind's doing in your area. I mean, obviously in the morning, you're gonna have a downslope wind, the cool air's dropping. By 3.30 or four in the afternoon, you're gonna have an upslope wind, but different canyons do different things. And so while you're scouting, pay attention. What temperature is it? What's the wind doing at noon? Because if you've got a slide in there, and you've got a squirrely wind while well, you're planning your stock, and you know that going in, geez, I was in here three days ago or three weeks ago, and I had a, a little downslope wind on this side of the ca canyon, all right, you can use that to your advantage, all right? So, so play the wind. And in sheep habitat, in all those canyons and rocks and stuff like that, it's not, totally rote all the time. So while you're scouting and while you're hunting, pay attention to what the wind's doing where you're at because you may need that tomorrow in the middle of your stop. 
Um, I personally write it down. I keep a, I keep notes while I'm out with somebody. I, I've never been on a sheep hunt that I had the tag, but I keep notes. Okay, so the take home message on this slide is watch for the group you didn't see. Okay, you, the, the rams are gonna be either all by themselves, the really big guys will be either alone or with just maybe one friend. Okay, the, the older they get, the more solitary they get. Um, if food's good and water's good, they might be in a group of four or five. You don't generally see big groups of rams until winter time, okay? Um, but you might have the group you spotted here and you're working your way into them and there's another group of three rams here. An example of that, a friend of mine had a poker gym tag years ago and we were moving in on a, a little dab of rams that had the ram he wanted in it, okay, which is another thing. But as you're moving in, pay attention to that other group that's laying up on the ridge. There, you'll have these here and you might stumble into this group. There may be a bigger ram in it, there may not be, but it's not uncommon to have two groups of rams in the same vicinity, or you got, you know, the, the ugly ram, the antisocial ram that the group won't let him in because he's ugly. And he's laying out here all by himself, okay? So if you bump into him, he might be bigger than the one that you're looking at, or he might have characteristics that you want and the horns that you're more looking for. So be careful when you're in your stock. Yeah, you're going to these rams. Pay attention for somebody else laying around. Because if you're in the stock, you're in ram habitat. Okay, all of this I've, I did out of, out of the schedule, okay? Um, I can't stress enough the importance of letting them stand up. If they're bedded down, and if you have to lay there, you know, you're on station at 11 o'clock in the morning. There's a good probability that you're gonna lay there till 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon if they decide not to get up and do the noon stretch, okay? Take a book, back off. If you got cell coverage, play with your rectangle. I don't care what you do, but let them stand up, all right? Okay, so after the kill, you've shot. Um, you guys now know more details about what's going on with the sheep on in your hunt area than your bio does. All right, detailed information that between the scout and that. So if you see something that doesn't make sense, please report it. If you see a violation, please report it. Okay. If you screw up, let us know. All right, um, pack the animal out. The, if you got an ATV or a UTV, please keep it on the road between the fire danger, and it may be a, just a little two track trail, but when the road peters out, put your pack frame on and pack them out. Between the weeds and the fire danger, the less ATV traffic out there, the better, is for the sheep. Not for you, sorry, we don't care about you in this case, okay, but for the sheep. So when the road peters out, park the rig, grab your pack frame, and you're packing from there, okay? Okay, so um, the important part of this slide is that bottom one, checking out and pinning the head. Because you know intimate details about that sheep herd that you've been scouting and hunting for the last several months, okay? You've gotta to go to an ODFW office and get the head pinned. 
ODFW would prefer that you go to the district office of the district that that herd occurs in. And for the years I was in Lakeview, I pinned a lot of sheep from the Harney District and from the Malheur District because people were going west to go home. And the, if they came out of the Pueblos, rather than hook up through Burns to get their sheep pinned and then you know, go to Medford to get home, they could just come through Lakeview and I could pin their sheep. All right, but you've got knowledge that the bios need to hear, okay? All that while we're pinning your ram, all that BS and about your hunt, they're gaining information about their sheep herds that they can't get out of a helicopter and they don't, the, the times that they're out there on the ground, they don't get, you have intimate knowledge. So if at all possible, inconvenience yourself enough to go to the district office that manages the sheep herd you just hunted. If you're in the Lakeview district, come to Lakeview. If you're in the Harney district, go to Burns. If, and this is the big one. If you're in the Malheur district, it's out of your way, but please inconvenience yourself enough to go to Ontario and talk to Scotty and Philip and John about what you saw and how your hunt went, because that's pretty good information that actually makes a presentation like this or makes a management decision for next year. So I know it's not always convenient. You've been out there in the dirt and the dust for weeks. All you really want is a shower, okay? But if you can inconvenience yourself enough to go to the district that manages your sheep herd, it helps the bio, okay? So any questions? That's it. There's a lot more to sheep hunting, um, but that's the little bit we know about it so far. Very good. Saw you, Jeremy. So next up, we have Scott Torlin. Scott is the current district biologist out of the Malheur district. He wants to talk to you a little bit about disease sampling. One of the more important aspects of why we want to make sure that you're coordinating with the bio for your local district. There's a lot of knowledge we need about these herds. All right, thanks, Jeremy. So um, I'm going to be real quick, and, and I really you know, want to reemphasize what John and Foz have said about disease and, and our sheep herds and stuff like that. And, and we need your help is what it comes down to. Um, hunters are our eyes in the field when we can't be. Um, you know, we're limited on our time that we can spend in the field, unfortunately. Um, so um, one of the concerns that has been talked about, and I'm going to um, reiterate a little bit here, is, is respiratory disease. It's a, it's a threat to all of our sheep in, in Oregon. And it's, really, it's a really tough thing to deal with from a management standpoint. So once sheep get infected, you'll have an initial all age die off and that can vary from 25% to 75% of the herd. And then from there, you're gonna have um, reduced lamb recruitment for a very long time. It depends, um, there's some variability in these um, diseases and, and another concern is spreading to healthy herds and then ultimately the loss of hunting opportunity. Um, there's a lot fewer people um, in this room than there should be because we've um, had disease exposures and have had to close hunts. Um, so how did disease, or this sheep get infected? So um, the disease primary we're talking about is mycoplasma ovo pneumoniae. It's a big word, um, but essentially it's a, it's a bacterial infection they get from domestic sheep, goats, and other feral sheep like mouflon and barbary, although the science is a little mixed on some of that. But, um, and so if you see any of these domestic sheep or goats on the landscape where you're hunting sheep, please contact your local biologist as soon as you can. There's some things we can do to address these situations and um, you know, we definitely need to um, get ahead of these opportunities when we can. So what to look for. So um, nasal discharge, snotty runny noses, bouts of coughing, um, excessive head shaking, and just they're lethargic. You know, they're, they're gonna be, they're gonna lag behind in the other herds when they're pushed. They're just gonna have droopy head and ears and, and just overall not look good. So, and if you see something, um, take as many notes as you can. Um, take pictures, time, date, um, location, GPS. Um, pictures are always good. And then the composition of the herd. You know, if it's, it's a U group with some lambs or if it's ram groups or whatever, any, any information you can gather and share with a biologist is great. So, 
hard to see in this picture, but this is a, a U with a little bit of a snotty nose. And I have a, a video or two. Um, we'll see if they'll play here. I'm not sure if that one will. Yeah, we'll skip them. They're just hard to see, but if, it, if you can see that. Yeah, we can kind of make it out. But anyways, this is a U. We had a hunter um, that observes this U off the rattlesnake herd in the White Horse country. And um, she's dead standing, essentially. This is late stages of mycoplasma ov pneumonia, And so essentially what that um, disease does is it causes the cilia in the throat not to be able to move that mucus out of their, um, out of their trachea and they develop pneumonia. And so, I mean, this is a pretty sad video to watch and kill her, but she is struggling to breathe. She's um, coughing, just it's, it's a miserable situation to deal with, so. Okay, and then samples. So um, when you come in to check in your bighorn sheep, um, we are going to be taking some nasal swabs out of the sheep. We're also going to um, be providing a letter to, your, to you to give to your taxidermist. And essentially, we're asking for um, that nasal cavity off these, these rams you're harvesting, in some cases used for others. And so we can take some additional swabs and, and monitor for some other conditions related to MOV. So it's just kind of a general um, surveillance that we do is, is getting a chance to swab these sheep for, for sampling. So in disease tests and stuff like that. And it's very valuable information for us to um, make management decisions and move forward. And so, and, and um, of course, another picture that's hard to see, but if you do um, harvest a ram that is, uh, has some abnormalities when you, when you gut it, you know, if you can, you know, collect what, what we call the pluck, which is essentially the upper portion of the lungs in the trachea, get it in a cooler and, and present it to us when you check in your sheep. So, and here's a quick diagram of, of the lungs and, and the uh, trachea that we're asking. So again, um, that's gonna conclude my presentation. So thank you for uh, your time and good luck on your sheep hunt. And, and we're looking forward to talking to you guys when you check in. So just to add on a little bit to what Scott presented for us, he talked about a lot about looking for domestic sheep and reporting those. If you have any of the northern hunts, so Deschutes River Canyon, McClellan, um, John Day River, watch out for some of the exotic sheep as well. So we've been seeing more and more out ad sheep starting to show up in some of the, the John Day Deschutes River country. Um, and we're very interested in samples off of those. So we're trying to identify opportunities to actually go out and sample the out ads to see if they're a potential vector, similar to what we see in the, the domestic sheep. So for the next presentation, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about field judging sheep, right? That's, that's what we're all here for. We wanna talk about what are we looking for in a ram? So I wanna go through some of the attributes of rams that how, they, how those different attributes factor into score overall for a sheep and some of the different characteristics you can expect to encounter as you're out in the field. So first, a lot of hunters always ask, you know, we talk about score, we talk about numbers, you'll always hear, you know, a, a sheep score put out and because there's not as much familiarity with sheep as there are with some of the other big game animals that you've likely hunted in the past, we want to cover what goes into the actual score. So there's, there's basically five measurements that are going to go into the overall score. First, we look at the length of the horn. So as you go to get pinned, when you go to check out your sheep, as we've talked about previously, um, we're gonna go through and take these measurements. None of our biologists are official scores, but we do this as a way to keep track and to keep records on the sheep. So we'll go through and we'll start with, with the overall length of both horns. Um, length starts at the base, goes all the way around to a point perpendicular with the tip. In addition to that, we're gonna take four different diameter measurements, one at the base, and then one at each quarter. We take all those numbers, we can put them into a form. This is the form that we'll fill out when you come check out your sheep at the end of your hunt. Um, and we'll be able to give you a score. And what is a score? Really, it's, you know, Boone and Crockett created the scoring system as a way to really track trophies over time. For us as biologists, they don't mean as much. And what we'd like to convey to you is that score is a number 
And really what we want to help you gather today is to look at the attributes that not only make a score, but also make the RAM that you're going to want on your wall for the rest of your life, right? So once in a lifetime, Oregon opportunity. So I think you've heard a couple times today, you likely won't get this chance again in our state. So really what we want to talk about is what you want to look for in a RAM to be proud of the one that, that you ultimately wind up with after your hunt. So the first factor that really goes into to field judging sheep is looking at mass. And knowing our challenges up there, I'm gonna go off mic and we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of these components looking at actual sheep. So when we talk about mass, that's that diameter measurement, right? We talked about taking the four diameters at the quarters, that, that's the mass of the sheep. Um, we really try to encourage hunters to go out you know, and look for sheep. You can judge the mass at the bases Roughly, you know, looking at the, the relation to the overall horn width to the eye, but also looking at the distance between the two horns as you're looking at them straight on. Um, and this is one of the most important components to scouting, in my mind, is going out and looking at a lot of rams in your hunt area and being able to start judging what that mass is, what potential mass there is within the hunt area that you have. Um, it varies a lot, not only between different hunt areas, but also between years. You know, we're coming off a five or six year extended drought cycle. That has an effect on horn growth. Again, not an antler, a horn. This, this mass grows continually throughout the life of the sheep. So they're, they're putting on new rings every year. You know, the second thing we look at is curl, right? And that's the length of the horn. We talk, you know, about that overall length measurement on this ram. We'd start at the base, we're going to measure along the perimeter of this horn and come out to a point perpendicular. So that's the length of the horn. And that varies a lot, especially as you get into the California sheep. California sheep are much more likely to broom. And brooming is looking at, you know, rubbing off the tip of that horn. So, you know, I think, I know this is one of the harder ones to see. I think this one's a little bit lighter. You can see this picture better. Again, getting out in the field and looking at sheep is the best way to start calibrating your eye into being able to spot a ram at a distance and be able to judge whether that's a mature ram or not. Um, the next thing that we really encourage hunters to look for is looking at characteristics of individual rams. And we got a bunch of ram heads on that far side as you start to look at rams, you'll realize that there's a lot of variation in how sh individual sheep carried their horns on their head. Um, you can look out there and you'll realize that, you know, a lot of sheep get a wide flare. We talk about flare when the horn comes off the head and starts to go out. You can see a little bit of flare within this Rocky Mountain bighorn here. He's pushing his tips out away from his face, right? So that helps carry that overall length on a sheep. Another important component on sheep, you know, as we start to try to gauge what is a mature ram, what is a ram we want to pursue, we can also look at the age of that ram in the field. Unlike deer, unlike elk, you can actually age the sheep just from the horn. Um, as you look, and it may be harder from the back of the room, there's very distinct, bold lines across this horn. Those are growth rings. So when you bring your ram in to check it in, that is how we as biologists are gonna age that ram. We're gonna go through and we're gonna count those rings and be able to age it. With good optics in the right light, if you're patient watching those rams, you'll be able to see that and you'll be able to start picking out the, the potential age of rams. Um, it does get difficult as they get very old. You'll start to see that those rings disappear. So I encourage everybody to come up and look and you'll start to see it on this ram here, the rings get really tight. So the first four rings or so are gonna be pretty easy to pick out. So once you see where that, that fourth ring, so this ram here, you know, you're looking at one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half years to this point, right? That first four years is where they're gonna push the majority of their length because it's growing faster in that early period. You know, here's year five on this ram, here's year six. They start getting smaller. So when you can get to that fourth ring, and then start to look at how much has stacked up between that fourth ring and the head, that's where you can start to kind of get an idea of how old that ram is that you're looking at. Um, and that's why they use that characteristic in Alaska as one of the criteria for a legal ram in areas where they have ram definitions. 
um, because it is easy for hunters with some time and some practice to be able to start to judge that age. Um, you know, the other things that we want to look at, again, we talked a little bit about brooming. And you can see that this ram has carried most of his lamb tips through. You can see how the horns come to a point. Um, you'll see a lot of other rams, especially in California bighorn sheep, where you end up with a blunt end. And you can see that in some of the rams on the table over there. You know, that's from a multiple, multiple different factors, um, whether it's that, that sheep feeding in the rocky habitat that California sheep typically live in that can rub those horns. It's also a kind of a side note to the impact that these go through, right? When they start into that rut behavior and they're butting heads, um, these tips, a lot of times right after the rut, you'll see where they've been fractured, didn't come in quite straight and took one to the side. Um, and they're not, you know, it's not always the iconic, you know, two rams meeting in the middle. They're always butting and nagging at each other throughout the summer. And that's one of the things you'll see as you're scouting too. They're, they're asserting a lot of dominance throughout that summer period. Um, but the real key we want folks to, to think about as they go on their hunt is spend the time to look at sheep and start to look for the characteristics you want. Whether it's that ram that flares out, the other component, and there's a couple on that table that, that show that, there's a lot of rams that will stay tight to their head. Um, and that horn is very compact and stays closer to the head. Um, they're very pretty rams. If you're looking for one with long horns, that's not always the best configuration for growing length in a sheep because they're much more likely to broom those, those horns off as they come around on their jaw. So it, it's really about going out and trying to identify the characteristics that are important to you. And if you're really hung up on that score, being able to go out and look at enough sheep that you can pick out those characteristics in individual sheep that provide the score that you're looking for. So um, I will put some of these pictures on a reel First, I want to open up. Does anybody have any questions? As we talk about, you know, field judging sheep, I mean, really, it's about looking at a lot. And I'd encourage you, as we we'll, we can break out, you know, as we're waiting on everyone else to come down before lunch, because that will be the next thing on our agenda. I think the easiest way in in our uh, depleted projector atmosphere is to actually go over and look at some sheep, whether it's these here or those on the table and start to look at those characteristics and walk through them. Um, another good judge that I like to use when I'm, when I'm trying to guess if it's a mature ram, when I look down, you know, looking at the horn, look at the relation of that bottom of the horn to the jaw. On, those horn, on the, the big mature rams, a lot of times they've pushed that horn down to where it's below their jaw. You can see on these, you know, the jawline is here. This horn comes down below that jawline. And again, this one has a big sweep to the back. Um, you know, this, this Rocky, Rockies and Californias have a lot of a different configuration. You're typically gonna see that tighter curl on a Rocky. They're gonna carry a lot more mass. Um, you know, where you're looking at, you know, bases that average, you know, 12 to 14 inches on Californias, you know, you're gonna add a couple inches for a Rocky. They just have more forage resources. They tend to grow bigger horns um, and they'll be longer. But look at this bottom quarter. Where is it in relation to the jaw and how big does it look? I always like to use the measurement of, do I think I can get my hands around it, right? So if I look at that third quarter and it's like, wow, that, you know, it's, you're seeing the, the base mass come all the way through and it doesn't appear that you can get your hand around, those are the rams you want to key in on. Those are the ones that have, you know, good mature characteristics coming out. But that can be difficult, especially in a lot of our Californias. One of those other attributes that you really need to tease out is do you want a ram with a long horn? Do you want one with the lamb tips? I've had a lot of hunters that want that lamb tip look. They want it to come out to a clean point. Um, and some mature rams will carry that. I've seen 10 year old rams that, that get more of a rocky flare and they protect that tip and they keep it throughout their life cycle. Others want the warrior. They want that ram that's only you know 30 inches long on his horns and he's completely broomed back to his third or fourth growth ring, they're out there as well. So that's a, one of those questions. Um, and I think a lot of hunters forego that true warrior type, the one that's broomed back, because typically as you get that heavier broomed ram, they're less likely to have as high a score, right? So especially in California is what I've seen, and I manage the Deschutes and John Day herds, 
our highest scoring rams are ones that are long horned, not necessarily as heavy, just because you don't have deductions on length. Um, it comes into a lot easier equation when you start doing the math to get a bigger score if you're looking at a 38, 39 inch horn versus a 32 on a broomed ram. So again, I'd encourage everybody to come over. We can go around the table and you know, touch and look at some of those, get up close and look at the rings. Um, another fatality of COVID, not having a good projector today, and I apologize. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, with that, I think we've got, give us about five minutes to get lunch put out. And then I would encourage you, get your lunch. Um, as you're waiting in line there, um, we'll talk about some sheep heads as we go through line. And then I encourage everybody to find the sign that kind of correlates with your hunt. I know our John Day signs are a little bit messed up. They still say west and east because we've had them for a while. Um, but we'll come around. The bios for those hunts will come around during the lunch period and try to find those conglomerations of our hunters and be able to start looking at some maps and talking about hunt specifics with all of you. I work out of the Dallas Patrol Office. I've worked here my whole career. And our patrol office is responsible for the uh, lower 100 miles of both the uh, Deschutes and John Day rivers. So. If any of you have those hunts, um, I, can, I can probably give you a few pointers. Um, my job as uh, Fish and Wildlife Enforcement, of course, is to, uh, I'm the referee of the sport. Uh, in my 20-some 20, 20 years career here, uh, I was sitting around thinking about it last night, and I've had the, the responsibility of uh, investigating 10 unlawful takes of bighorn sheep in my career um, and out of those 10 we made arrests on nine of them so that pretty good batting average um, so that being said uh, most of the hunters I check really enjoy this hunt uh, they have a they have a great time it's usually a big camp um, the the success of the hunt is really high most of the hunts are done in the first day or two um, most of the guys and, and gals that enjoy the hunt the most are the ones that do the prep up front like they've been talking about, do all the research, do everything that's within their control initially to prepare themselves for the hunt so they don't have any regrets and, and playing catch up and feel all the pressure as the hunt nears. I've seen people go out, you know, they want to kill the biggest sheep in the canyon and those ones, when they finally kill their sheep, it's more of a sense of relief than actually enjoying the hunt. So some of the guys have said that in that, just look for the sheep that makes you happy, not necessarily get up in this competition of which one's gonna score the best. And you'll find that you'll probably enjoy your hunt a lot more. Um, of, those, of those cases that we've worked, uh, most of that, most of those cases investigations begin from people like yourselves that spend a lot of time in the field and being eyes and ears and, and seeing stuff that isn't quite right. Or, you know, hear things and relay that information to, to where we can start looking into it. So uh, I would encourage you all, in addition to, to uh, making yourself aware of the local biologist for your hunt, reach out and introduce yourself to the game wardens that work that area. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, they're going to probably have some information that will help you on your hunt as well. But two, you'll know who to contact if uh, you see something or heaven forbid a uh, mistake happens or you get hurt or you need help on your hunt. A lot of times people don't realize that we're an excellent resource for that as well because we know how to get into spots. We have the equipment and the ability to get a lot of help to you quickly um, regardless of what, what your need is. Uh, I'll throw the pack board on and we'll help you get stuff out if you hurt yourself, if you have an illness issue, um, you're, fighting the, you're fighting the heat and, and a potential waste issue, you know, we're, we're a resource for you as well. Um, so that being said, anytime you hunt and you hunt long enough, mistakes happen, things happen. And if, if it does, if it goes down that way and, and something goes sideways, reach out to us and we'll work with you and we'll, we'll help uh, minimize the, the damage on those situations. Um, so
So a couple things that people have said I'll, I'll reiterate too is someone mentioned phone scope. You know, I'm not a, obviously a, gonna sponsor anything here, but we use those as well. And what those are, are a, it's a system that, that it's a case for your cell phone. And they have adapters that go on your spotting scopes. And you know, if you spend a lot, you're gonna spend a lot of time looking through your optics, right? And you're gonna, your eyes are gonna get fatigued and everything else. So this is an option of not only further zooming in on some stuff and getting uh, pictures and video of what you're looking at, but it gives you some eye relief too. Uh, obviously, we spend a lot of time looking through optics, so we, I use these both personally and professionally, and, and, and I can't say enough about that product. It's usually about 100 bucks to get the two things together. Uh, it is legal to use handheld radios on your hunt. I noticed one of the slides said use a spotter. Uh, in Oregon, you can use radios. And I've seen, and I've been watching some hunts myself that were not successful because they didn't leave spotters. You know, they spot the sheep and they go after it and it moves on them and the train looks a lot different when you get closer so that is excellent advice leave a spotter behind to communicate to you as you make your stock where those animals are and uh, when you when you're getting into position you'll probably see a lot more success one thing to talk about a lot of these hunts you're going to have limited cell service okay so those of you that have chosen the electronic license option for your license and tag, um, my advice to you is log on to your app prior to leaving service and stay logged on, okay? That way it will work so you'll be able to validate your tag once you harvest your animal. Uh, that, that's, we're in the third year now with that system and that isn't translating very well to folks. It's, it's built that it works anywhere and it does, but you have to take that step in logging on prior to leaving service because you're not going to be able to log into the app if you haven't logged on beforehand. And if you're not logged on, you're not going to be able to tag your animal. Okay, So be sure you get, get that, add that to your list on prepping on your hunt on how to make that happen if that's the option you've chosen. Um, so like I said, I, I, I patrol the the John Day and the uh, Deschutes. So I'll hang around if any of you with those tags have any questions or want my contact information, or I can probably direct a lot of you to the right trooper that's in your area as well. Uh, another good resource um, that I use for per personally and professionally is the Onyx app for your phone. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a GPS uh, mapping application that shows uh, land ownership uh, and it will work on and offline you can download the maps while you're in service and then be able to uh, use that for reference uh, and keep yourself uh, where you should be on your hunts and uh, be able to also interact with your your uh, hunting party to let them know where you're at if you need help or if something happens to let us know where you're at if you need help so that's another good, excellent tool uh, for those of you that aren't aware of that one. Uh, all I can say is, you know, congratulations once again. Uh, you're very fortunate to have these tags. Uh, I think the raffle tag, or excuse me, the auction tag for the bighorn sheep recently went for over $200,000. So what you have is quite valuable. Um, so please treat the hunt and the sport and the animal that you hopefully will harvest with the respect it deserves. You know, put a lot of effort into the hunt and, and do it right because uh, that's, what it, that's what it deserves. And I'll stick around if anybody has any questions or if anybody has any questions right now. Um, any questions? All right, thanks for your attention. And, you know, and I think we always try to encourage hunters, no matter what, to help us in the field. Um, whenever we see a violation, to be the extra eyes and ears for Oregon State Police and ODFW. That's at a whole different level when we're talking about sheep. As you heard about today, the efforts that have gone into sheep restoration, um, these animals are, are very valuable to all residents of the state. So if you see anything on your hunt, please don't hesitate to reach out to State Police. Um, as our kind of final wrap up from the Oregon Finaz side, I'd like to introduce Tom Peterson. 
Tom's a board member and he's going to talk about the important work that Oregon Finance does and, and why they put on this, this orientation. Tom? Hey, congratulations on your sheep tags and goat tags. How many of you drew on your first try? Anybody? One? Is that it? <laughs> Two? Okay. Three? Okay. Anybody take more than 20 years to draw? <laughs> A lot of hands on those. Wow. Well, I was in the very first drawing back in 1965 when they let the first bighorn sheep tag. And I was in it this year also, and I'm still waiting. <laughs> I've also been in six western states for 25 years for sheep tags, and I'm still waiting for those. Now, I'm an expert on applying for sheep tags, but I'm not very good at drawing, unfortunately. So about 15 years ago, I thought, well, I'll join FNAWS and help sheep conservation, and maybe the sheep gods will smile on me and drop a tag on me. Well, I'm still waiting. <laughs> but my 15 years with FNAWS has been a real eye-opener, I'll tell you. It's, uh, the average person doesn't realize what goes into these, keeping these sheep on the mountain. Uh, when this chapter was first started back in 99, the mission statement was to, to put sheep on the mountain. But over the last 20 years, we've discovered it takes more to keep them there than it does to put them there. Uh, there are so many things involved with keeping these wild sheep populations stable so that you folks can have an opportunity to keep them. It's, uh, and like I say, most people don't understand, but uh, a lot of the things we do, we collaborate a lot with our uh, 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 sibling organizations in Washington and Idaho. Uh, we also coordinate hugely with ODF and W. Uh, we do a banquet every year and either a deer tag or a goat tag to auction. Uh, we got $75,000 for our goat tag this year and that buys a lot of con conservation, I'll tell you. But the problem we have is we only have 300 members and we need sheep hunters or people that, that have an interest in sheep for our membership. And it's a pretty small uh, population group that we have to choose from for members because the only kind of sheep hunters out there are either folks like yourselves that are very lucky or else the, the very wealthy. And there's nothing in between. <laughs> I mean zero in between. <laughs> You're one or the other. And so it, it really makes it difficult to, to get new membership in here. And we charge 30 bucks a year for our dues. And you know, my opinion is that just about anybody could afford that. And like any other sporting organization, uh, power comes in numbers. And our 300 members, we've, we've managed to put together close to a half a million dollars worth of sheep conservation in the last 20 years. And with 300 members, that's astonishing. We have a few, a few of our members are just extremely generous. But we're like everybody else, we need the numbers. And the things that we do, we've, we've funded over the years, we've, we've funded lots of trap and transplant projects. Uh, I think the average cost today to, to transplant a wild animal with a helicopter is running about 1,200 bucks a head. Uh, you trap, transplant, 25 head of sheep, you're talking a few bucks here. And then after they get transplanted, they usually need radio collars and, and all that stuff and the equipment that goes with it. Here again, more money. Uh, we've been involved in uh, collaborating on land acquisitions over the years, uh, domestic sheep buyouts, we spent money on that. Uh, we've been giving 5,000 a year over the last 20 years to the, the uh, Eastern Washington uh, uh, university up there where they're doing disease research. Uh, they've had that full-time professor for 20 years trying to get to the bottom of this stupid disease that just keeps killing these sheep. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, uh, funding for disease testing. Uh, our board members, uh, we have 20 board members on our, on our uh, uh, foundation here. And I have to tell you folks, as I stand here, the other 19 members of this board that I serve with have got to be the most unselfish people I have ever met. These guys will do anything to keep these sheep going out there. And it's been a tough go. Uh, 
We not only have the disease to worry about, we just got wiped out here over the last five or six years at the Heart Mountain Refuge. The refuge managers down there, they let the stupid cougars in there and they've completely eliminated that sheep population. So now who's gonna have to fund the money to get those sheep transplanted back in there? <laughs> Oregon Fanaz again, okay? But we need help. And I guess that's what I'm here in front of you folks today is to, to ask all of you, if you can find it in your hearts, to join our organization. Even if you pay your 30 a month, or 30 a, a year in dues and don't ever show up, you're a huge help. Uh, you get a newsletter occasionally when we get one out. <laughs> we do three board meetings. We sponsor a banquet, a fundraising banquet once a year. We're doing it at uh, Eagle Crest Resort the first Saturday in May. Uh, we have a great time. We have great raffles. You folks want to pick up some great hunting gear. A chance of that with raffles. We have guns. We have hunting trips. Uh, we always have a, a first class hunt of some kind to to raffle. Uh, ODF and W treats us pretty well on that one. Uh, oh, and uh, we get to do one auction tag a year. Uh, we take part, uh, the Oregon Wildlife Heritage Foundation puts on a youth outdoor the first Saturday in June down in Corvallis. And they have 750 kids from the mostly the Willamette Valley area that haven't had much exposure to the outdoor stuff. And they put on a great show down there. They have uh, fly fishing, they have archery, they got skeet shooting, they got uh, birdhouse building, and those kids just, they just have a great time. It's a full day of, of fair. Oregon Fanaz has a display we set up down there. We show them the, the pictures of the helicopters bringing the sheep in on the transplants and, and show them skulls and horns and how they all age out. and all the ins and outs of that stuff. Uh, this show, and uh, we also, we sponsor this particular uh, activity. Uh, when we first started with FNAWS, it was, it was all kind of a money thing. So then we started asking, well, what can we do? Labor that goes into this also. Uh, 10 years ago, they had a real problem on the Deschutes, on the lower Deschutes. They had a, a major infestation of Scotch thistle. And those Scotch thistles were in there like a jungle. They were as big around as your forearm and inches apart. And they covered the riverbank on both sides, all the way down the lower Deschutes. And Oregon Fanaz, 10 years ago, went in there. We started floating the river in June and have a group of a dozen guys with sharp sh shovels. And we were out there by hand with those shovels cutting those damn thistles out of there. And Keith Cole was the, the biologist at the time at the, at the Dalles there. And he told me then, he said, we will never get on top of these thistles. He says, this river bottom is lost forever. And Oregon Fanaz kept in there. Jeremy got involved in it. And we got smart finally and spent some money and got some, some weed sprayers going. But we're still to this day, there's a maintenance program in there to keep those thistles at bay because they just, they want to keep coming back. So that's a big one. We've been involved over in the Dayville area on juniper cutting. Uh, the junipers got so heavy in there that the cougars would lay in wait for the sheep and ambush them, uh, plus the water that they suck out of the ground. So Oregon Fanaz has started a program here 10 years ago where we go over and do a, a three or four day juniper cut and I just spoke with a biologist here recently and he said we've managed to cut over 200 acres of that juniper area so far. And uh, that's an ongoing thing. So our constant maintenance with sheep. Uh, also, we, uh, we have been involved in the better part of 12 guzzlers over 20 years across Southeast Oregon. And here again, we go in and build a guzzler we can't just walk away and leave it. We have to go back and maintain it, make sure it's in well repair. The sheep are using it on and on. Uh, this year is a little different this year because of this drought. Uh, they put out a call, I guess Arizona just, that might be changing now with their monsoon they're having, but as of a week ago, they were just in a panic that all of their guzzlers were drying up, lack of rain. 
So now they started a program, they're trucking water into all those guzzlers. Well, here again, all it takes is <laughs> big bucks, lots of them. So the Wild Sheep Foundation and all of our chapters collaborated, and so far we've raised $165,000 for water catchments to refill them. So as you can see from this, we, we do a lot. We have done a lot, and we intend to continue doing a lot to keep these sheep on the mountain, for all of us to enjoy in the future. But this year when you're all out there and you get that crosshairs on a wonderful ram, give a fleeting little thought. He didn't walk in there on his own. Didn't happen. Took a lot of collaboration from guys like Jeremy and our board members to keep the money flowing to make that happen and to keep making it happen. So if any of you would find, find it in your heart to join Oregon Fanaz, we would sure appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, so that's the end of our formal program. Again, we've got plenty of time. We still have the room for a couple hours. Pick and prod the brains of your bio. Um, figure out the ins and outs with your map of where you need to go. Um, Marcus has one more announcement for the Oregon Fanaz side as we break out. Uh, thank you all. It's the last time I'll come up and talk to you, so thank you for coming today. And uh, we'll hopefully talk to you soon. <laughs>